Indriyebhya parayarta artebhyascha paramanaha manasastu para buddhir buddhir atma mahan paraha The sense objects are higher than the senses, and the mind is higher than the sense objects. But the intellect is higher than the mind, and the great soul is higher than the intellect. Now then, the senses are gross. The artha sense objects by which those senses were created for their, that is, the sense objects' own revelation, are certainly para higher, subtler, more pervasive, and are their inner selves, indriyebhyaha, than those senses, which are their own effects, the sense organs having been created from sense objects for perceiving them. Artebhyaha, as compared with even those sense objects, manaha, the mind, is param higher, more subtle, pervasive, and is there in herself. By the word manaha is indicated the elements in their rudimentary subtle form, tanmatras, which are the material cause of the mind, for they are the originators of volition and conjecture. Manasaha api, as compared with even the mind, buddhihi, the intellect, is para, higher, subtler, more pervasive, and is there in herself. By the word buddhihi is denoted the rudimentary elements, tanmatras, which are the source of determination, etc. Buddha, as compared with the intellect, Mahan Atma, the great soul, is higher. It is Atma, the soul, because it is the innermost principle of all the intelligence of all beings. And it is Mahan, great, because it is the most pervasive of all. This principle, called Hiranyagarbha, which was born before all from the unmanifested maya, and which consists of both intelligence and activity, is called the great soul, that is, paraha, higher than the intellect. Mahata paramavyaktam avyaktat purusha paraha Purushana parang king chitsa kashtasa paragatihi. The unmanifested is higher than Mahat. Purusha is higher than the unmanifested. There is nothing higher than Purusha. He is the culmination, he is the highest goal. Mahataha as compared even with Mahat, the great soul, param, higher, subtler, inner self and the most pervasive, is avyaktam, the unmanifested, that which is the seed of the whole universe, the essence of unmanifested name and form, the state of combination of all powers of causes and effects, called by such names as avyakta, unmanifested, avyakrita, unevolved, akasha, space, etc. Resting on the Supreme Self through and through like the power of a banyan tree in a tiny banyan seed. Avyaktat, as compared with that avyakta, purusha is paraha, higher, subtler and greater, being the cause of all the causes and the inmost self of all. And therefore, too, he is called Purushaha, literally a person, because derivatively he fills up everything. Ruling out the possibility of anything being higher than him, the text says, Purushatna Parankinchid, there is nothing higher than Purusha. Since there is no other substance beyond Purusha, who is a mass of pure consciousness, 
The Purusha is Kashta, the acme, the culmination of subtleness, greatness, and inwardness of self. Here indeed end all subtleness, etc., commencing from the senses. Hence, this is Paragatihi, the supreme goal of all travelers, all individual souls that transmigrate, because the Smriti says, going where they do not return, from the Gita. Namaste. So these two verses give a background, an ontological system of levels or states of being that are attained one after the other by certain meditations. And we're going to discuss those meditations in the next video. Here, I want to talk about the system itself. The ontology is the background knowledge that gives us the meaning of the meaning in the verses. And this is absolutely necessary that we don't interpret according to our own opinion or our own views, but try to understand the views of the author. That's, you know, that's just the sane way to go about it. If I write you something, you know, so let's say I send you an email and you're not sure what it means, doesn't it make sense to write back to me and, and, and you know, ask me, hey, what did you mean by that? So in the same way, we want to go back and try to understand the author's intentions, the worldview of the author, and how they are pitching these texts, these mantras, so that this worldview is explicated with a view to attaining self-realization, because that is the purpose of all the Upanishads. So what is he saying here? He's saying that there are these different levels of being from the senses to the sense objects, to the mind, to the intelligence, to the great soul, and finally, to the Purusha. Huh? The unmanifested is there too. And that, of course, is the total material substance. But beyond that, beyond that Maya, uh, because the material world doesn't really exist. Uh, I'll give you a hint. <laughs> Only consciousness is real because it's eternal. Everything else that's fabricated has a beginning and an end. It's just name and form. Like when the clay is in the ground, we call it clay. And when it's made into a pot, we call it a pot. But what is it? It's still simply clay. And when the pot is broken, it goes back into the soil and again becomes clay. But this clay and pot are just names of ours that describe the form and function. And the, the really, there's only clay the whole time. Well, in the same way, the universe is only consciousness. Yes, it appears to have solidity and uh, beingness and all of that, but that is just borrowed from Brahman. It's just a reflection of Brahman in the name and form. So the existence of the material world is simply illusory. Just like the reflection in a mirror, just like the image on this video, huh? It's simply a reflection through this technological apparatus of my body sitting here and me talking, and so on. So, there in the um, Tika to verse 12, there's an argument. Uh, a after he says that when one reaches Vishnu, when one reaches the highest, Purusha, that one does not come back to this material world. He doesn't re take rebirth. And the objection is, it is not a fact that when there is going, there is always coming as well. Then how is it said that from which he is not born again? That's in Katopanishad 138. 
Shankaracharya's response is, there is no fault. Since he is the indwelling self of all, the fact of realizing him is figuratively spoken of as attaining him or going to him or going to the spiritual world and not coming back. And that he is the indwelling self is shown through his being higher than the senses, the mind, and the intellect, what to speak of even the great soul, even the unmanifested. Shiva is higher than Shakti. Brahman is higher than Shiva. Brahman is the highest. One who goes to the world of Brahman, whether it's the superior or the inferior Brahman, never returns to this material world. So he who is a traveler goes indeed to something that is unattained, non-imminent, and non-self, but not contrariwise. In other words, in the material world, our conception of a traveler is that he goes from point A to point B, from an origin to a destination, and these are all within the conditioned world. But the Vedic text says, those who want to get beyond the ways of the world do not walk on roads. Itihasu Upanishad, 18. So this is just a simile. This is just a metaphor that he goes to the Supreme or he attains the Purusha. What it actually means is that he attains the same state of being, which actually is there all along underneath because the Supreme is indwelling in every living being. Try to understand. The Supreme is there in the heart of hearts, within the soul, within the intelligence. It's described earlier. And the intelligence is equated with the heart because that's how we determine our direction in life. So once the intelligence grasps the idea that we are going to the ultimate, we are going to the supreme, we are going to that place from which one never returns to this world. How? I am Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. And that means I'm already Brahman. I have always been Brahman. And I will always be Brahman. Simply, the Brahman is covered by upadis. Upadi means a covering. It means an overlay, a projection, an imagination, a fabrication, huh? <laughs> a superimposition on the actual self. Actual self has no qualities, no birth, no death, no existence in the same way as things in this world exist. Uh, it has its own existence in its absolute realm where there is no beginning and no end, no time, no space, no cause and effect, no change, etc., etc., etc. No even space. Try to imagine it because this is already there. It's already yourself. So, by your thinking, it is said, I forget the source, somewhere in the Vedas, as you think, so you become. So if you begin to think of the absolute Brahman, a good way to do that is by chanting Aum. And so the Vedas proclaim on every single page, before every single mantra, Aum. Tad Vishnu Paramang Padang Sada, or whatever the mantra is. There's millions of mantras in the Vedas. But all of them begin and end with Aum. So in other words, the first word and the last word, the Alpha and the Omega of the Vedas is Aum, which stands for Brahman. And if you look into the meaning of Aum, which is described in the Mandukya Upanishad, the Mundaka Upanishad, and also here in Kata Upanishad, and in great detail in the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad. I mean, all the Upanishads glorify and describe Aum. It's not just 
a simple thing. It's deep, very, very deep. So by chanting Aum, one comes into tune with Aum, with Brahman, because the qualities of Aum are exactly the same as Brahman. Now, how does this work? You might say, well, it's imagination. You're simply imagining that this symbol represents Brahman. And yes, that's true. But imagination is a very powerful thing. It's imagination, for example, what, who is that? Um, think and Grow Rich. That guy, I mean, was it Rockefeller? I don't know. Anybody who is successful in this world will tell you the same thing. You have to create a mental image of yourself in the state that you want to reach in the future. That is the first step to any kind of success. So in spiritual life, the success means actually getting rid of all the stuff that we have piled on top of Brahman. One time, my Buddhist mentor, Bhikkhunyanananda told me, whatever you have done, that you have to undo. Neti neti, not this, not this, not this other thing, nothing, nothing. Huh? Take it all away. Take it all off, as the razor commercial says. <laughs> then we discover the real self, even beyond the void even beyond the unmanifested, the Purusha. And the Purusha <clears throat> can have any face you want, can have any form you want, but the Purusha is the real self, and by becoming one with him, we reach the highest enlightenment. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.